Hey, this is David, and I'm here with a pretty big announcement. Uh, today, I'm happy to announce that I am going to be teaching a summer course on language creation at UC Berkeley. It's going to run from May 22nd through June 30th. It's uh, three units, and it's going to be basically me teaching you how to create a language along with the basics of linguistics if you don't know them already. Uh, well, not the, not the super basics. There, there is a prerequisite, which is just uh, Linguistics 5, you know, the super basic introduction to linguistics or Linguistics 100, the upper division version of that, um, or my permission. Basically, what I want to know is that I don't have to teach you what a phoneme is. So if you're a conlinger, you're probably fine. Uh, anyway, though, it's going to be um, Monday through Thursday from 3 to 5 p.m., and it's going to be, as I go over to the website, <laughs> it's going to be in Moffat Library, room number 106. Uh, so anyway, if you are in the Bay Area or a UC Berkeley student, um, you can sign up now. There's still seats available. It's called uh, The Linguistics of Game of Thrones and the Art of Language Invention, and its uh, number is Linguistics 183. Uh, I am super, super excited about it. Obviously, this is a this is kind of a dream come true, and um, no, I don't live in Berkeley. I will be commuting up there to teach all four days of classes. Um, it'll be fun. I have family up there. Uh, plus, you know, I, I went to Berkeley. It's a cool place. Um, anyway, so, uh, so that is it for the time being. I am looking into the possibility of trying to stream the course somewhat while I'm doing it but it will probably be very low tech, like me bringing my laptop there and turning the camera on. Uh, but it's dependent on there being Wi-Fi in the room and it working in general. I've never tried uh, the YouTube live stuff um, and I have no idea about the quality. It would be really cool if you could actually integrate slideshows with that. But I wonder if it could only be Google slideshows. I don't know, anyway. Um, that's something I have no experience with and we'll have to just figure out on the fly. But um, anyway, uh, I just thought I would let you know, just in case you're in the area and are looking to learn how to create a language. I'll also be going over, uh, you know, because we wanted to put Game of Thrones in the title, I'll also be going over the Game of Thrones languages in detail for a couple of courses. Um, anyway, uh, so, uh, op conlang, I thought I would just talk a bit about spelling conventions, because when you are a freshman at UC Berkeley, one of the first things that you have to learn how to do is how to spell the name of the college because it's not super obvious. That is, there is a silent E in there, or three E's in Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y. Um, those of you who are familiar with the word Berkeley might also be aware of at least two other spellings. So we have, you know, UC Berkeley, the university, spelled with three E's. Then, of course, especially if you're my age, you have Elizabeth Berkeley, who spells her name with two E's, otherwise the same. Um, and then, of course, there's the famous Berkeley College of Music, uh, which is spelled B-R-E-K-L-E-E. -E -E. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, these are all spelled the same. How exactly do these things come up? Um, and so I know that we haven't gone over uh, a lot about creating scripts yet. But I at least wanted to talk just a little bit about how these spellings come up. So if you look at the etymology, of Berkeley. The, the Burke part of it comes from birch, and the Lee part of it comes from like meadow or something. So it's like, you know, field of birch trees or birch tree meadow. That's that's what Berkeley ultimately means. And so the, the reason that you get these alternate spellings is um, oh, one of three things. Uh, one, I mean, first there's just the original spelling, whatever it is. Uh, but, uh, so that would be, for example, the B-R-E-K-E-L-E-Y. That was probably the most original spelling. Or, I don't know, probably got, it's the, it's the standard one. Uh, the other one is that the spelling will change if the pronunciation changes. And so that would be Elizabeth Berkeley's spelling. We dropped the silent E there in her name because people heard it and say, why, why is there an E there? It doesn't make any sense. So they dropped it. Uh, for the Berkeley College of Music, that's interesting. It was actually spelled exactly the same way as Berkeley in UC Berkeley. And they decided to change it because people were getting confused, thinking that that uh, the Berkeley College of Music was somehow, you know, located in the East Bay and was associated with UC Berkeley. And so they just decided to manually change it to uh, prevent uh, the confusion. Um, 
But that's actually three reasons why spellings change in writing systems. So not in or, or remember, we're talking about orthographies here, not romanizations. If it's romanizations, there should be, I mean, it should just be phonetic. I mean, come on. Um, you can only expect so much from people. Uh, but for the actual orthography, these are three reasons why spellings change. And you can actually use these to create variant spellings in your languages. Here are a couple of regular spellings from Castathon to give you an idea how this can work. There's one uh, particular derivational affix that is now pronounced schwano that just means kind of, I don't know, place of. It's, it's used for tons of words all over the place. It came from a series of affixes that were at one point in time pronounced diribanu. Then there were some sound changes that caused, you know, the D to become a J before E and the B to become a V in intervocalically, the final U changed to an O. And so it became something like, you know, the, I don't know, uh, Jirivano. Pretty soon people started smooshing the pronunciations together. So it became something like, you know, Jirivano, 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 Shrivano, Shwavano, Shwano, just like that. It kind of scrunched together in, you know, over the stages because it was just a little bit of stuff at the end that got pronounced quickly. Uh, so what happened was the pronunciation caused the spelling to change. So the word would have been spelled like this at one point in time if we were talking about uh, Geshwano, the word for market. Uh, but then because the spelling changed, or the, I'm sorry, because the pronunciation changed so radically, they decided to change the spelling. So now it's more phonetic and it's spelled like this. And so it actually looks like Geshwano. So that's one example of how spelling can change. Uh, another is uh, just a quick example showing two words that are homophonous, but that are spelled differently because of it. So, for example, um, there is a word that means to own or to possess, and the way that this word was formed was from an affix fa that was added to a root hind, and then it was turned into a verb so that the citation form of the verb would have been at one point fa hindu, like that. Um, of course, there were sound changes and everything, and what happened with this particular prefix is that a lot of time it just gets reduced either to, you know, just a single syllable file with no long vowel, or just a single consonant. And in this case, since there was an H which disappeared, and there was a short I which was going to retain its stress, um, the, the prefix shortened up into a single uh, letter, and then it got pronounced, uh, you know, fiendu, when there was breaking with the vowel there. Uh, and so the usual way that it would be pronounced was if the A uh, and the H just weren't even there and you just spell it. But there was an older word that blocked this spelling. So there's another word that uh, the root is actually F-I-N-D-U and it's a noun and so in the nominative it's now pronounced Fiendu, which means bone marrow. This word is pronounced identically to the infinitival form of the word Fiendu which is to own or to possess. And so because there are these two homophonous words, uh, speakers of this language decided to spell the word possess, which is the newer word, decided to spell it a little differently and gave it a phonetic spelling to distinguish it from the noun. And so those are just a couple of reasons why you might have variant spellings in a language that you're creating or a language whose orthography that you're creating. A lot of fun to be had there. Anyway, though, back to the non-Obconlang topic. Uh, so just as a reminder, I'm teaching a summer course at UC Berkeley, a six-week summer course, four days a week, 3 to 5 p.m., uh, Moffat 160, I believe I said, and it is Linguistics 183. So if you're there and in the area and are interested, I would love to see you in class. That's it for this episode. If you have a question that you'd like for me to answer on the show, leave it in the comments or send me an email at djpquery at gmail.com. If you want to see more videos like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.